Myself to the songs and dance of Uma, Durga, and Sarasvati. I search through the thoughts, senses, and meditations for Brahman. I make confessions to priests in robes. And still, earth, water, wind, and fire have me by their passion, fertility, beauty, and creativity. O oh, Mother Divine, Ma'at, Mata Dev, I cannot follow a God that doesn't shower your manifestations with passion flower petals. You are the Supreme Madre Grande, the pulse that beats inside of silence, beyond a Father God, Buddha, Brahman, this human heart wishing to be welcomed at your lotus feet to offer a brief desert cactus bloom within the sacred fire and water let consume me. Oh, good, good way to start. Uh, this month, May, May and June, uh, we celebrate down here um, Ganga. I put together this Navarati doll for. Ganga. Ganga is a goddess. I use the word goddess for convenience. The uh, Indian name is Devi. So, and so that's who this is. Ganga is both a Devi, a goddess, and the major river flowing there in India. And along with the, uh, her is this crocodile, Makara, who is also her vehicle, her Vahana. And so a symbol, I think, also of the heat of summer. And here I have the crocodile holding this bottle of holy water from the Ganga. So people you know, can carry out puja with the, that kind of water. So I put all that together. Next I'm coming over here to, this is my drawing. And this drawing is energia, energy. And what I'm featuring here in this drawing is right here, right here at the base of the neck. I call it the Vala Chakra. It's just below the uh, the Vedasura Kaya Chakra of the throat. But this is at the base of the neck. And this is a uh, Energizer is a very subtle one. I also call it synovia in the Spanish sense with my girlfriend. And also uh, synovum meaning related to her womb. And this is right here at this center and in my drawing I've related it down here into her womb. So this coordinates energy um, it's also somehow perceived as a watery chakra, something fluid, and so it has that, you know, with, within it. And uh, if you look at me, I can can show a demonstration here. You know, if I put my finger, you know, right here, uh, at this little hollow at the base of the neck, and slightly vibrate it, you know, slightly vibrate it. And then, in the Indian sense, you know, a chakra, you know, a mantra, what I mean, a mantra, anam trinam sanam, anam trinam sanam, anam trinam sanam. So that should put everything in order, and it also seems to relate that sense to the perceiving womb that I had spoken of earlier. So all in all, 
This is about energy. This is also a nerve center. We call that a nerve center. This is all conceptual, but it seems to be borne out in uh, like ultraviolet rays and things like that. I'm speaking of it conceptually. So we can go down here. This is my altarpiece here of Kali, you know, along with this very traditional goddess uh, oil lamp. So that you can see her here. <clears throat> but this is uh, a devotional piece. Then we can go up here to this centerpiece. This is a very traditional figure of Kali. In India, it's called Murti, and Murti translates as crystal. You know, crystal in a full sense, you know, to uh, crystallization, also like the crystals that they used to put in radios, meaning, that, you know, it transmits, it uh, communicates. So here, she is a figure of, of uh, energy, a figure of energy, a tinomorph, I think it's called, or a tinoform, a tinoform. So you can see that array of, of her. Also, the candlelight, the flame in front of her is also considered her, plainly. So if we go all the way over here to another feature of her, uh, this is um, from India. This is a silk screen cloth. I like it very much. You know, uh, it's um, very straightforward, <laughs> creative piece of Kali. It is Kali here. And of course he has you know, many, many symbols. They all you know, are described and have meanings, you know, uh, skulls and hands and Shiva and all of that, you know. Uh, so you can figure all that out. But basically I would say she is a bundle of radiating energy here. So we really will be looking at that. If we just go, since we're over here, we'll go right down here below her. And here I can just tell you a slight little story. You're seeing, you're seeing her head here, and this is a special pot. You know, this is a kumkara, a flowered or flowering pot. Now, pots figure all through the Indian culture. You know, like I said, they put them on temples. They have all, all kinds of uses and names. Some are made of clay, and some are made of metal of all different kinds. So that's so we have a little story while we're focusing on that. Way in the beginning, like eons and eons ago, in cosmic time, there appeared, appeared there, an egg-shaped ball. <laughs> and this ball swelled up and burst, and out of it came step the woman, Sakti. Sakti is a name that we call for this uh, female creative energy. So the, she stepped out there, and she was alone. She kind of looked around and, well, and she had three eyes, you know. And this third eye was in the middle, we call it netra, in the, in the middle of her forehead. So we uh, definitely recognize her with that. <clears throat> so she looked around and she said, uh, I'm all alone, I, I need a male uh, companion. I need somebody to couple with. So she waved her hand and she created Ganesha, and she created Vishnu, and she created Shiva. And she said, hmm, which one uh, do, of these do I want to couple with? She said, oh, I think I'll couple with Shiva. So that was her choice. And so Vishnu leaned over to Shiva and whispered in his ear and said, watch out for that third eye. It could be very dangerous to you, like that. <laughs> and so that gave Shiva a way to make a proposition to her. She said, he said, oh, I'll couple with you if you can give me your Netra, your third eye. So she, you know, gave that a brief thought and said, okay, like that. So just she, you know, plucked out her eye from her forehead and placed it in Shiva's forehead. And no sooner had she done that, than Shiva opened that third eye and looked back at her and that immediately turned her to stone. And so she was totally inanimated. Perhaps her spirit had even uh, fled away. So that was not a very good situation. So Vishnu, being very creative, he uh, 
said, I know what we'll do. Let's make, let's make a pot. So they made this little a pot, you know, that we're calling this flower pot or, or flowering pot, you know, the kumkara. And then somehow they came up with a couple of drums and rattles and they started making music, you know, that da 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 however that music goes. And sure enough, lo and behold, it brought her back to life. And it, she appeared here in this flowering pot. And so that's her and how she got to be there. After that, it became sort of a, a nomination. Women who were her mediums or her clairvoyant uh, agents like that then bore the name, you know, the woman who comes with flowers or woman who wears flowers in her hair. And this also got transferred to uh, young brides. So that was kind of a little little title. So that's, you know, how she got to be there. And I kind of put down here, you see this, this egg-shaped rock with OM on it. <clears throat> and over on the other side, this is another bottle. Uh, you get this in the Hindu store. Uh, this is water actually from the Ganga. And it's got a picture of Ganga, you know, on the cover of that. Now we can go up here to this. This is a pomegranate. I introduced this idea the other day. Uh, the name India, you know, like that, that's all come down from the Greeks and all like that. And then the Indians, their usual national name is Bharat. Uh, and, but there is a feminine name. And there's, there's you know, and before all the Aryans and those guys came in, the feminine had a name, you know. And that is, is the uh, Jambud Bapi. The Jambud Bapi means literally the rose apple, which is the pomegranate. And that's what I have here. Now, the whole uh, continent of India is her, it is the pomegranate, like that. And different parts of India have parts of her all over. And all the way up in the very northeast of India, as far as you can go, it's almost an island of a country there. It's called Assam. In Assam, there is a uh, temple or a shrine for her vulva or her womb there. And that's called Kamakaya. And of course, Kama is always mean love and desire. So we definitely have that, you know, located there, you know, for her to realize that. Just something, you know, anecdotal. Um, as a graduate student, I was living in Mexico at Lake Pascuaro, and I stayed with a family, a Traskan family, on one of a few islands that are in that large lake, it was the island of La Paganda. And from them, actually the senor, it told me that this lake is her body and the islands are parts of her body. So, you know, there's a similarity there that I could relate there to India being her, her body with different parts to her there. <clears throat> and then we can, uh, let's see, where should we go right up, up here? Let's see, you see this, this face with all the hair on it? Kali really just means black. So there's all kind of ways to say why why she's black because she's hidden, she's in disguise, or she's all colors. You have all those kind of things. Uh, so that's what we have here. That this is Kali, the black. And so to relate with that, if we can come all the way over here, this is a little painting that I did a long time ago in my rendition of her here, and she's you know has a a uh, red star here. The pentad is also a symbol of her, like that, and, and down here, here is an actual little uh, statuette of Kali from India. You can see her there. And then down below here, uh, this is a Dakini piece. Uh, the Dakinis are, um, it's a, a woman, a, I do say, a, a woman's consciousness within Buddhism, Tantric Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. So uh, what, it, what it seems to have done is take all of the, what I would call all these misnomers of the woman's experience of living and brought them in and systematized them in a Buddhist belief system. 
is the way that I put it, putting it. And this one is, you know, very major of uh, Vajra Yogini. And it seems to me, you know, like she holds a skull and, and, and a, a thing of blood and all like that. And so it seems that she has sort of a, absorbed, you know, some of the features, the Hindu features of Kali. And that's why, you know, I'm having her here like that. Then I want to go all the way over here like that to see th this piece here. Uh, this is being called in Hindu lingam. Lingam, as a word, really, simply, straightforwardly means mark. But uh, somehow what's happened is that this word and the item have all been somehow oddly changed into a phallic symbol. And whose phallus is it? It's the phallus of Shiva. So that Shiva becomes a phallic god. <laughs> and so all that has been made of this item that really belongs to her. So you're looking at an official, official thing here of, of a lingam. It's a real one like that. <clears throat> and if we come down here to this piece down here, I have uh, this is more similar. This is more similar to what it is originally. Now, originally, it's named the Bhagshif. The Bhagshif means the felicitous, uh, you know, felicity, a very, very happy um, organ here. And so that's the way I have featured it here. Uh, so it's not, you know, actually a, a palace at all. Uh, it's her clitoris. It's her clitoris and the uh, happiness and good fortune that goes away, goes with her uh, manifestation, if you put it simply there, you know. And kind of seem to go with, I have a banana next to this. The, Banana is also because it doesn't require, you know, pollination or fertilization. It is, stands also for her, you know, parthenogenesis. So it's, it's a symbol of the goddess and uh, definitely accompanies, uh, you know, her altars. It definitely put on her altars, you know, you know, for that. So that's a very good way of seeing that. Uh, I think we'll, we're going to focus on this. Kali, if we can um, go up here to, you know, to this Murthy again, so I can read this poem. This poem is actually from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, Ramakrishna was you know, kind of a holy man, or he became a holy man. Uh, he was uh, somebody who spent his life in a temple, sort of as a caretaker. And one of the things he took care of was the, you know, the Murthy, the image of Kali, which he developed, you know, extraordinary relationship with, and had many, many visions and apparitions, uh, and it also summoned, you know, other experiences that he had. So he kind of fulfilled the whole Hindu ideal of the meaning of all of these deities and their images. Uh, he lived long enough that uh, Mahatma Gandhi, in his diary, definitely recorded visiting with him. And then uh, his, uh, Ramakrishna's, uh, like, he had many followers, but one of them, uh, an educa university educated man, Swami Bhikkhi Khandanda, uh, then came to, well, he came to America, but he came to Chicago first, and he was the first time a, you know, Honest to God, <laughs> Hindu came outside of the country like that. So he came to, I think it was the World's Fair or something. Uh, maybe they had some kind of an exhibit. Subsequently, uh, he established in San Francisco uh, a temple. There, the temple is there in San Francisco. Now again, he, he was uh, at least English influenced and so forth, and that's what made any of this possible. So the uh, Ramakrishna mission is what it became called, and what it is featuring is the Vedanta, the Vedanta, um, the continuation of the Upanishads in India, uh, came here to America in an English form, Vedanta, and I was a member of the Vedanta in Berkeley and San Francisco. Uh, so, uh, 
basically Ramakrishna was a kind of holy man, I guess you could say that, but he becomes, you know, the, the prompter, I guess, you know, for the Ramakrishna mission here in America. Anyway, that's where this piece comes from, and I'm going to read that. O oh, Kali, I'm going to devour you this time. Therefore, I ask you, O oh, Kali, O oh, ever blissful Kali, the enchantress of the heart of Almighty Makala, you dance alone and you sing alone, clapping your hands. O oh, Mother, you are the first cause, the Eternal One, in the form of the void and wearing the moon on your forehead. When the universe did not exist, where did you find your string of severed heads? You alone are the mover in everybody. We are but instruments in your hands. We move as you make us move. We speak as you make us speak. But restless Kamalakanta gently chides you, saying, Mother, the destroyer of all, holding your sword. Now you have devoured both my virtue and vice. If I die uttering, victory to Kali, victory to Kali, I shall assuredly attain Shivahood. Then what is the use of going to Banaris? Infinite are my mother's Kali's form. Who can find the end of Kali? Knowing a little of her greatness, Shiva lies prostrate at her red hued feet. So somehow that's you know printed in, in the Gospel of Ramakrishna. Whoever composed it, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, here I want to you know show you th this piece that I've created here. Uh, the word Naga is ubiquitous throughout India. It means snake or serpent. <laughs> and um, it's in everything and everybody, uh, all personages, including Buddha, you know, definitely Buddha, got his fame from the Naga and so forth. And in the very east of India that I was saying, uh, Assam, the state of, of India, on the very uh, eastern edge of the state of, of that is another little tiny country, belongs to India, it's called Nagaland, Nagaland. And the Nagar people there still seem, you know, kind of uh, primitive and in terms of, you know, their uh, products, you know, of holy art and everything. They seem to be closer to what it may have been a long time ago. And so there are people also of the lineage of Naga. Now, in India, lineage is major, major, major. <clears throat> and so there is, you know, a very ancient lineage of the Naga. And so it's supposed tentatively that this Naga may go back to remote, remote antiquity. And so with all that, you know, I, I created this piece, you know, uh, as saying to me also the Naga or the serpent power is the awakening in the womb of the woman. And I've created this piece, you know, uh, to say that. Exactly. So, this is you know exactly my Naga deity, and here you see this flower here. This hibiscus is a uh, Chabaka Usuma is what it's called, and it means it stands for her uh, fertile womb. So we're doing all of this you know for for woman and for the goddess of woman, uh, so, and that's why I have the snake down here below the uh, pomegranate so that I would remember definitely to get the Naga in here in, the, in this talk. Uh, the focus of this country and if not the world on women, on women's rights, on women's choice, you know, uh, to me, you know, gives a lot of energy to this theme and that's why I'm definitely taking this opportunity to bring as much together in this as I can. And so now I will uh, introduce, this is my centerpiece here. We can go up here and look at this. And let me start by saying, because you all know, Leonardo da Vinci, he was an inventor and a painter. 
and the Mona Lisa, I reckon strongly, that that's an expression of his muse. It certainly is very mysterious. So I want to say about this that I am Coyote and I'm an artist and here this is my muse. This is my Mona Lisa, <laughs> as you, you would put it, like that. <laughs> and I uh, titled this uh, Bija, Bija, uh, Prana Bija, Kuta Bija. Uh, what is the Bija? You know, it's Visam uh, Karanam Sula Atman Para Sakti Sakti Haki, like that. It means that she is the light that's the root of the universe. And this is an apparition, and the name Bija actually occurred, actually occurred in the form or image that she first incipiently appeared to me, and I really did not even know at that time the meaning of Bija, but that's what I've named this from that first incipient apparition. And so you can see here, uh, she is surrounded by this uh, cloud, and this is a cloud of condensed energy. That's what I have have here. And this here that I simulated here, uh, this is Hiran Garbaha, meaning she is concealed behind a golden veil. Wait, I'm making that here. And here her face appears and she has, you know, this Vasanti, this eye that sees, you know, through all things, through the nature of all things. And her teeth, you know, showing this way means that she's in transition. This is a transitional apparition here from, you know, like invisible to visible. And, you know, as she is appearing here. And here her, her breast and her uh, breast nipples here. I've adorned them like a uh, painting with uh, sandalwood paste, which would be uh, a lover's adoration of her in the Kama Sutra. And here the upraised here, her kadaka uh, as her sword, as she has in all her icons. And of course the, the sword or the blade, you know, cuts us under, you know, uh, ignorance and all those kind of things. And then over here, here, uh, this is a word or letter from the Sarada script, like that. Uh, her mantra is called Ahamsaha. And what this is, is... It's called the plow because it kind of shapes like this. This is the you know the inhalation and the exhalation. So it's the, the prana and the apana. That's what's all being featured here. Uh, and it's I would say part and parcel of her. And this breath is going on in us all the time. You know, it's called you know soundless or vowel vowless sound that we're all breathing, you know, in and out, in and out, in and out. Prana is, you know, the making of life. So all of that is in there. It's also called uh, Sahira Aham Sita, meaning uh, it's in our body. Our body and the breath in our body maintains our natural link to the life force. So we have all that in there and this is the Bindu, you know, uh, you know, the cause of all that continues. And over here I have another little item. This is also from the Sarada script. This is the letter Ka, also for Kali, and so also black Kala. And so I have, you know, the crow feather here. In some icons, you can see that the crow will uh, accompany her there. Since this is also uh, the month in order of, of celebrating, or say, uh, Asian Americans and uh, Pacific Island of people like this, I uh, have this one here. It's by Leora Kaba, and she's a Tonkin uh, a poet, and uh, that's why I'm going to read her poem. She's at San Francisco State University. Um, her poem here is Pronunciation. 
For now we speak only in brooms, sweeping sand across the teeth of concrete slabs. We brush and repeat each stone syllable of the clearing where our great mothers are buried. Some words for memory are always here, sounded out by the ant feet, hefting sand grit and glitter homes, fan light over the blue tongues of plastic flowers. The weeds will try to cover all the other ways of saying history. But our pronunciation begins with the clearing we make in our bodies first, where the broom handle widens the O's in the mouth of our hands. How we shake open the throat to settle each pile of leaves before burning them. Trust the body to open in our language with the rhythm of weight, one hand pushing sand, the other pulling symbols. In one last sway, as we close the gate of the mala'a, so the trees can better hiss hush at the edge of the ancestor speaking in all our names. That is so beautiful and relates us very, very much you know, with India and Native America and all of the Pacific Islands in between. Uh, so.